Peace, fam. And good morning to everyone out there. And again, I want to welcome you all to another conversation inside the bullpen. I know it's probably a little after 10 now. I apologize. Uh, running a little late this morning, but also Oprah called wanted me to be on the Oprah show. But I said, no, we got to bring the brothers on. So I can't do it, Oprah. But, but thank you all for being patient uh, with, uh, with me and with the bullpen conversation. As always, you know, make sure that you, know, you subscribe to this page. You know, you like this page. Uh, send, you know, share it with a family and friends. I have two very strong, beautiful, special guests on uh, this morning. The brothers are going to introduce themselves, but I just want to send a shout out, as always, to Dr. Minister Asar for allowing us to use his space this morning. As always, thank you, Dr. Asar. He's been very instrumental in having the conversation inside the bullpen. But also, uh, my beautiful queen, uh, Mama Harmony, you know, she typically heard a moment with Harmony. She broadcasts on, on Saturday. But because of some events that took place yesterday, we're bringing the first grandchild into the world. Uh, she had to reschedule for 10 o'clock this morning. So if you have an opportunity, go to YouTube, put in Harmony Davis, a moment with Harmony. And she's bringing that spiritual food for you all this morning. So with that said, I definitely introduced uh, you know, to my left, right, here, we have brother Marvin Garner. And to my right, have brother James Muhammad. I want to welcome these brothers both. They're going to introduce themselves and talk a little bit. And we're going to dive in this morning. This morning conversation is a long-term uh, long-term psychological effects and challenges faced by returning citizens, their families, and their children. So we definitely want you guys to sit back, to tune in. That's going to be a great show. So, uh, brother, um, sorry, brother Marvin, brother Muhammad, welcome you both, brothers. You know, thank you for being here this morning. And if you will, just you know, you tell the uh, the millions of people out there watching this morning, brother. You know, a little bit about yourself. I start with you, uh, brother Marvin. Yes, my name is as the brother has just informed you. My name is Marvin Scott. Um, I'm a returning, a returning citizen uh, after many, many years of being subjected to um, conditions and situations that I don't think most people, unless you have actually experienced it, even begin to understand uh, the detriments that a situation such as that can create for the individual as well as the topics that you expressed today the effects that it has on an individual family. Currently, I am uh, a member of PFI, as well as another organization called the Sons of Phoenix, as well as an organization called Order Out of Chaos. All of these organizations are designed specifically to address a lot of uh, the effects that trauma has created in, um, in the people. Yes, sir, brother. Yes, sir. That's what we're doing, and that's mm -hmm. why basically that's who I am. Well, well thank you. We really appreciate that, uh, my brother. Also, brother Muhammad. Yes, sir. I some like with my brother. Well, like with Muhammad. Uh, peace, man. I'm James Muhammad. Uh, I spent a lot of time in prison, 21 years to be exact. And um, like Marvin, I'm a part of TFI, and our objective with TFI is to present to the to the masses. Um, how trauma has affected us yes, sir. Mm -hmm. through long-term mm -hmm. incarceration. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when you say TFI, what does that stand for, brother? The Family Incorporated. The Family Incorporated. TFI, the Family Incorporated. Yes, sir. Got it. But also, I'd be remiss if I didn't send a shout-out to my big brother, Yah, even though he's not on this morning. That was the brother that was on uh, April 24th, you know, who definitely brought that truth. He's here and in the audience with us, making sure that we stay on point. So should be Yah over there, my brother. Uh, but definitely, as, as the brother, both brother Marvin and brother James indicated that, that you know, both men themselves has been was incarcerated for for long term. So when we talk about long term, we're talking about, um, as the brother indicated, you know, multiple years in prison. And I was just thinking this morning, you know, preparing for the show, you know, just kind of going over notes and everything. And, you know, and, and, and I'm not exaggerating if I would say that uh, depending on when you came in incarceration under any condition, any time can be very traumatic. Mm -hmm. But you spent the day inside behind that wall. I mean, you know, it, it can affect you in some way, depending on what you see, what you're exposed to, what your experience may be like. Some men have gone in on day one and life has changed forever. Maybe it took longer for other men. But definitely the long-term incarceration phase, you're talking about 20 years, 30 years, mm -hmm. 40 years that brothers, you know, have, have, have who have were incarcerated and some are st still incarcerated. What kind of psychological effects? So the topic is long-term psychological effects and challenges. So I want to begin this morning with the question, brother, brother Marvin, is that we talk about the psych, like personally, psychologically, what has been some of the challenges that you had to deal with? Um, 
I think the biggest challenge that I had to deal with and accept was that damage had been done. Yes, sir. You know, and um, after coming to the realization that damage had been done, I had to, well, divinely, it was noted to me what damage had actually been done. And um, one of the things that they were seeing in me were things such as um, being hypervigilant. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. um, another thing that they saw in me and I was able to accept and relate mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. was the ability to not be able to um, self-regulate uh, my emotions. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, another thing was avoidance. Mm -hmm. um, and all of these things were uh, direct components that were associated with my confinement yes, sir. Uh, that also um, contributed to things such as uh, my depression, things such as my anxiety, mm -hmm. things such as those things that were things that I was experiencing prior to the incarceration and was exacerbated while being incarcerated. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so as the audience has heard, the brother talked about he used two two words. I really want kind of want to drill down in. One word was was hypervigilance, and the other word was was uh, was avoidance. But also, he talked about the psychological effects of that. He talked about depression. He talked about anxiety. So, brother Muhammad, when you talk about hypervigilance, kind of what comes to mind when you hear the brother talk about it? You yourself was in twenty one years. So, talk about hypervigilance. What, what what is the brother referring to? Um, what being depressed. No, you say hyper hyper vigilant. You know, being incarcerated in prison and where well, you know, you know, being in that environment mm -hmm. where um one is an unnatural environment. Mm -hmm. It's about to full of chaos, it's violent. So we being hyper vigilant, meaning that you become so alert within your environment that mm -hmm. not as trusting, you know, right. you're constantly watching, you know, you're watching your back, you're watching the men who approach you, you know, whether it be administration, you know, just always that you really can't relax mm -hmm. because the environment is such as it, you know, is 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 a the condition within itself, the mm. environment within itself, it create a mindset that literally you having to put your back against the wall, if you will. Mm. So you've been hyper vigilant, just making mm. sure you just always in tune, mm. not allowing yourself to become, you know, to sleep to where you are, to become a victim to where mm. you are, and 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 not focusing on and realizing that that any day this environment today is that brother today mm -hmm. you make it very well be me mm -hmm. so you really literally you can't rest so you're mm -hmm. always constantly being aware of your surroundings even within being happy within yourself mm -hmm. if i one of the things i've always shared is it wasn't so much that i worried about the next man as i worried about myself mm -hmm. you know what what i would do and then how do i continue to place myself in that environment mm -hmm. so the brother talked about being hyper vigilant mm -hmm. so what were some of the experiences that um to be honest in that situation um, it's life or death. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Meaning that um, you in a jungle. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. And you have to always be on your P's and Q's. Anything can happen mm -hmm. at any moment, whether it's coming from a cell buddy, it's coming from a guard, um, minor issues. Mm -hmm. I stepped on your shoe. Um, I didn't say excuse me. Yes, sir. Or mm -hmm. I stepped on your shoe. I looked at you. That could cause you to go into the shower with a knife in your neck. Yes, sir. Um, so you always hyper um, alert. You yes, always sir. aware. Mm -hmm. You really don't get no sleep. Um, you can't really sleep because you have to be on guard. You have to be prepared for anything that takes place, and you have to suppress um, certain emotions of being sensitive. Yes, sir. And mm -hmm. and in general, mm -hmm. um, you have to be hard mm -hmm. and stern because mm -hmm. that's the environment. You know, mm -hmm. unfortunately in that situation you're not treated as a human right yes sir so mm -hmm. you're dealing with a lot of um savage mentality right mm -hmm. so you have to be alert at all times mm -hmm. any given day you could lose your life mm -hmm. any given day you see i'm glad you brought that up because as, as you know as as, as you both if you, the audience have, have heard you know brother marvin brother Muhammad, what they're referring to again so I, I want you to think about because i really want to create a picture you know of an environment but also but i want you and within that environment i want you to think about spending multiple years in that environment as we mm -hmm. say you know so you know that the slogan goes you know 20 years without a rest you know 30 years without a rest and i want you to think about the state of mind and you you know right now 
uh, one of the, I say the, um, the um, what's in the news right now, if you will, a current event is the war uh, with you know Ukraine and with Russia. These soldiers uh, are in, say, on the battlefield, but they're constantly having to be on alert because you know Ukraine is trying to take the Russians' life, the Russians trying to take Ukraine life. So literally, they're having to prepare themselves in a state of mind that where they can't sleep. They'd be very watchful because at any moment they could lose their life or being put in a position where they have to take someone else's life. I want you to take that same. But what happens is what the brothers are referring to is there's something within us that we, we often hear about the word fight, flight, or freeze response. We're talking about an autonomic nervous system that where what we call the, is the parasympathetic nervous system, and then there's the sympathetic nervous system. What happens is the sympathetic nervous system, it goes to, it kicks in where we talk about that fight, flight, or response. But I want you to think about being in a situation where it gets stuck, if you will. You think about an automobile that, you know, you put your, you put your foot on the acceleration and it has this high-pitched noise, you know, so that's, but I want you symbolically, I want you Think about that analogy as someone nervous system, if you will, is being being stuck in a particular gear, if you will, just constantly on alert. OK, and this is why that uh, when the brothers come home from the military, they have to be debriefed, mm -hmm. you know, because when they come home, they say, well, look, you've been engaged in conflict, you know, maybe 18 months, maybe a year, you know, of, of, of exchange of gunfire, of death or watching their battle buddies be killed. So now they have to be debriefed, meaning that they have to go through a series of psychological tests and examination to bring them back down. Now, take that same, if you will, uh, description and place that in an environment for 20 years, mm. for 30 years, a brother having to be on the alert. Because keep in mind now, because when we're facing danger, even in just imagine danger, per perceived danger, we get into the alert state. So now you're constantly on the, <coughs> excuse me, you're constantly on, on the alert. So where your uh, parasympathetic nervous system, <coughs> excuse me, what happens is you got to go into a flight mode, you got to go into a fight mode, or you go into a freeze mode. So you run from the situation, you deal with the situation, or you froze within that situation. But now you're talking about a situation where there, there's no relief from that. Every day, every way, you wake up you, in that same particular mind. So now these brothers return home. And that alert, if you will, has been turned on for 20, 30, or 40 years. And so you bring that, as Brother Bob indicated, hypervigilance, he bring that back to the environment now. You just don't turn it on and off like that. And so now, even though he's not faced with, you know, the confinements of being in an institution, but still the mindset, because now we have to deal with the triggers. You know, a smell, something happened, mm -hmm. a scene that can very well take place on the out environment. It could very well be within the home. You know, something can be said. I can remember using an example myself is that, you know, from being incarcerated, constantly being told, you know, what you can do, where you can go, where you can sleep, you know, got to move to this dormitory, got to move to this cell, you can be being transported to another prison. And so, but now, and my wife, you know, at the time, didn't, didn't mean anything wrong. It just, it, it, maybe the way she said, well, I need to do this right here. And I literally go off. You don't tell me what to do. Because my, I'm being in that environment, being constantly told what to do, you're not going to tell me what to do anymore. Mm -hmm. But it comes out on her. That was a trigger. So the brother talk about the hypervision was very real. I'm glad you brought that up, <clears throat> brother Mohammed, as well as you, brother uh, Muhammad, in talking about. But so now talk about now 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 transferring as you both have described. Now obviously we know we on the outside, the other mm -hmm. side of the wall. How has that been? You know, making that transition. Whereas, <coughs> excuse me, making that transition. Whereas, okay, how do I deal with this, if you will, for lack of a better word? Well, <coughs> you know, the transition comes in different stages. Um, yes, sir. But before we talk about the transition, mm. I just want to uh, pivot off of what you and Brother Muhammad said in reference to it be, that being stuck. <coughs> yes, sir. And see, mm -hmm. being stuck in a hypervigilant state mm -hmm. causes very, very unhealthy um, processing. Yes, sir. Because mm -hmm. you see danger in everything. Mm -hmm. So in the transitional stage, coming back into mm -hmm. society, I saw danger in my own home. Mm, yes, I saw sir. danger mm. when I had to go to my parole officer. I saw danger when I was going to in, uh, <coughs> my employment. Everywhere I turned, because mm -hmm. utilizing your terminology, because I had been conditioned to be stuck in a hypervigilant state of existence, mm. danger was everywhere. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Not realizing mm. that the greatest danger 
that I was facing was in my head. Yes, sir. Was mm -hmm. in my brain mm -hmm. where trauma is, is initially stored. Mm -hmm. Thus, we say that trauma begins biologically. Right, right. Because mm -hmm. of the way that our brain or our <coughs> hypothemis mm -hmm. records the trauma. Mm -hmm. So it, it was uh, quite an experience. And the hypervigilance, mm -hmm. uh, and I love your word, by me being stuck, mm -hmm. impeded upon. Mm -hmm my emotional self-regulation mm. everything went from zero to a hundred yes sir yes, i remember sir. um mr muhammad uh i had the pleasure of being under his ministry mm. while um we were serving a great portion of that time mm. and i don't know if mr muhammad remembered this but as we were transitioning we had gotten to a place in our incarceration that's known as camp. Yes, sir. And mm. we were having a situation, while well, I was having a situation and I was sharing with them, with Mr. Muhammad, this guy thinks I'm playing with him. Mm. Mm. And I, because of being stuck, um, I began to take and screw a, my, a broom handle mm. off of the base of a broom. Yes, sir. And mm -hmm. because I hadn't quite been able to transition effectively, mm -hmm. I was ready to hit this gentleman in his head mm -hmm. with this broom, basically mm -hmm. because he was stirring in my direction. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And mm -hmm. through the tutorship of mm -hmm. Mr. Muhammad, he made me realize that, brother, sometimes you may view a thing mm -hmm. as if it is a thing, mm -hmm. but it's not that thing. Right. Yes, and sir. so I was mm. able to take that kind of knowledge back home with me. Mm. And so when I was in my home, and as you spoke so eloquently about when my wife seemed to be affecting my mm. autonomy. Yeah, yeah. Because right? mm. my autonomy had been mm. affected for 32 mm. years. Yeah, that's right. That's you right. Know? Mm. And in that, I began to perpetuate uh, the mm. Peter Pan syndrome. Mm. Mm. I went in with some remnants of being, or I thought, mm. some remnants of being self-sufficient. Right, right. And was dormant, and that self-sufficiency was dormant for 32 years. Yeah, that's right, that's right. And then I came back into society, and uh, under the teaching of Mr. Muhammad, I remember he gave a class about being son. You remember mm. that, brother? Mm. I remember. <laughs> yes, and mm -hmm. I felt like, man, mm. I'm being son. Mm. Okay. Mm. And no. so that's mm. how the transition was. Mm. And it wasn't, you know, and I don't want to make, uh, uh, I don't want it to appear as if my loved ones or my mm. wife mm. was doing this intentionally. Right, she was right. trying mm. to help me. Right. And see, and I'm glad you brought that up because many times, I would say oftentimes more than not, is that if it was our wife, our, uh, our mother, our father, our siblings, they really don't know about incarceration no more than what they've heard right. maybe maybe seen on television maybe read in the book but now they're having to live with someone or go through that experience with someone and they in their mind when um you know when marvin left and came back you know 32 years later they was they and they're possibly in their mind they're looking for the same marvin if you will absolutely you know or the same muhammad or the same you no know, brother ali when he came home but i came home even though the core of me was still intact to some degree, but a lot of me had changed. Mm. I was a different person when I came home. I know I was a different person, and I left a lot. Unfortunately, I left something of myself uh, within, the, in, behind those walls, if you will. And so, when the brother talked about, you know, just having that experience that where, um, you know, when he was at the camp, if you will, and 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 in his mind thinking that, okay, well, you know. Do I, do I need to do, basically, if you will, do something to this brother, right? What's going on with him? I'm saying, like, it may not have been anything, but getting to a place within himself, understanding that, as you described, is that you may think something is one way. It may not serve to be that way. You know, what the experience was for you also, whether it was inside the institution or outside the institution, where something was triggered within you that was directly can be correlated because related to the environment that you was in. And she and I had went out um, one time to a lounge. Mm -hmm. And because the lounge was so small to me, mm -hmm. small, mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Um, I wasn't used to that environment, mm-hmm. you know, being in um, a small uh, atmosphere with a lot of people mm-hmm. rushing past me, right? Yes, sir. Touching me, yes, sir. Mm-hmm. So um, we were sitting down uh, talking, and a guy had uh, walked past me, and he rushed up against my shoulder. Yes, sir. So immediately, mm-hmm. my mind went to me being in prison and yes, how sir. I would mm. react to that and respond mm. to it. Mm. And what I done was I just turned around and I watched him. Mm. And I kept looking at him. Mm. And my wife had asked me, you know, why are you mm. looking yes, at him like this? Yeah. Make sure we in my him. mind, like yes, if sir, he bro. had looked back mm. at me, mm. I would have took that as an act of aggression. He mm. done that on purpose. Right. And yeah. I was going to do physical harm to him. Mm. And she laughed. And mm. later on, mm. you know, we laughed. Mm. But Later on, I mm. thought about that, mm. like how psychologically mm. I was damaged. Yeah, because mm. that's something that um, it's common; it can mm. happen. Mm. But because the environment from where I came from, mm. um, you have to always be alert. Right. And that's any it. act mm. of aggression um, mm. against you, and you don't respond, mm. then that's a sign of weakness. weakness. Right. And you will be taken advantage of mm. your whole entire state. Mm. So. Um, the transition mm-hmm. for me was more so I suppressed a lot of things mm-hmm. and I withdrew. Mm-hmm. So coming out, I came out with that mindset. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Like you said, your core came out. Yeah. My shell came mm-hmm. out, mm-hmm. but internally mm-hmm. I was going through a lot. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. nothing prepares you for society, mm-hmm. meaning yeah. nothing on the inside prepares you for social interaction right mm-hmm. so i withdrew mm-hmm. deep like a turtle mm-hmm. and that's the way mm-hmm. i moved mm-hmm. um if it wasn't for the help of my mm-hmm. wife mm-hmm. a law through my wife mm-hmm. um, taking me different places mm-hmm. and saying certain things mm-hmm. i don't know how i really would have reacclimated myself into society mm-hmm. because i wasn't prepared for it right and the way i deal with things um I go into a shell mm. and I hold it. Mm. And that's the psychological damage that I brought out. Mm. Okay. Because that's what I would do in there. Mm. I would just hold it. I would bottle that up. Mm. And, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm glad you shared that with you know, you know, with us, brother, because you know, again, if we go back and we go back in terms of what what was said early on in, in the conversation, you know, uh, brother Marvin talked about he talked about avoidance use the word avoidance and depression you use the word about being withdrawn so these are psychological if you will effects of the long-term incarceration now it doesn't mean that people on the outside doesn't experience mm-hmm. that but but what we're referring to obviously you know the theme of it is that you know men you know returning citizens who have who who who've had that experience in what way were they impacted by their long-term incarceration so the incarceration so the long term if you will you know the 32 plus years the 21 years being incarcerated, you think you no, know, that's the, if you will, the the you know the external piece, if you will. But then the internal struggles with is result from that, the psychological consequences, you no, know, will be depression, will be anxiety, will be being withdrawn. But also the triggers are still there. So how do you cope with the triggers there? So when you talk about something being triggered, you know, I think about you know my own experience in coming home because you know, I always say that I look at, I kind of put incarceration in like two different phases, if you will. You know, no one wants to be locked up in any stage, whether it's 2022 or whether it's 1970s. But I, what I realized in going back, you know, uh, the, uh, it was called the Medical Correct Institute of Jessup, uh, you know, working with the brothers behind the wall, it's a different environment in, in, you know, in the context of the exchange among the men is different. And I give you an example of what I mean by that, is that when I came home, say, in, in 90, got out in 94, and, you know, going in prison, say, you know, in 83, but yet being exposed to the prison early on in my life, incarceration in, in 1971 at 13 years old, you know, one of my first arrests. So I came in an environment during the time that where certain language just wasn't used. If the language was used, it was used for a particular reason. An example is this right here. When I got out in 94, now you're talking about 1994, I totally changed. I'm on the basketball court. Uh, you know, at the rec center playing basketball, playing with some young kids, young kids, you know, taking me to the hoop, 
No, and excuse my language, sister. And the brother used the word bitch. He just said, bitch, you can't handle me. Immediately I stopped. Mm -hmm. Because I came up in the environment, the only time that word was used, either you wanted to fight or you thought who that person was. So now in this environment, particularly we didn't even play like that. You know, we, we didn't play like that with one another. So I don't know this man, but I realized in that, you know, in 1994, that was a common language among young kids these days. They talk to one another, you know, call them all kind of funny names. They go down cold land, bitch, I slammed on you. But for me, it triggered something to me. Whoa, brother, what you doing? You know, I be stopped on the basketball court because I'm, I'm, we can get some straightening behind this right here. You know why? Because I don't know, I mean, we know, and, and for him to use that language, but I'm realizing within myself having to make that transition, if you will, that I'm living in a different time. So I'm bringing if you will, an old, I would say my way of thinking to a new environment, not un having to understand the new environment which I lived in. But because, again, when I came along, uh, a man never dressed another man like that. One, we didn't know one another. We didn't play like that, if you will. But particularly stranger and just calling someone that, no, so that was, say, that was fighting words, bro. You know, you got to clean, you got to straighten that up. And, but so for me, that was just one experience. You know, having coming home and realizing that the environment that I'm in is totally different from the environment that I came out of. And so with that, uh, you know, your brother talked about that psychological piece, if you will, you know, the, you know, being withdrawn, you know, being avoided. So now talking a bit about now, even though you're not at the time where you wanted to be, but now you have family around you. Mm -hmm. And so you have children, if you will, or maybe grandkids, nieces and nephews. And so what some of the ways in which uh, your family may have been, if you will, impacted by, say, the fact that you're home now, but yet after gone 32 years, you know, what was some of their experience, or maybe even said anything to you uh, in the Bible world? You know, I'll, I'll let you tell the story. Well, mm -hmm. uh, I think the biggest thing that my family had to experience was the fact that the person who returned, like mm -hmm. you said earlier, wasn't the person who left. Mm -hmm. Whether that was good, bad, or indifferent. Mm. It was a whole um, different person. Yes, sir. And I returned to different people as well. Mm -hmm. Because while I was living in my condition, doing the best that I could do mm -hmm. in my condition, they were living in their condition, trying to do the very best that they can do. Mm -hmm. A unit had been broken. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. And um, because that unit had been broken, there was a whole period of re adapting to each other mm. and learning the functions that each one of us had to perform. Mm. Because when I left, I kind of was like the matriarch. Yes, sir. But when mm. I came back, mm. because I had been gone for so long, other people had taken on that particular role. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. And um, initially, I felt like I didn't fit in. Mm -hmm. When I left, my children were relatively young. Right, right. So whatever I said mm -hmm. was law. Right, right. When I right. came back, I, right. like you said, I didn't even understand their language. Right. And mm -hmm. they didn't understand mine. Mm -hmm. So it was like, what you talking about, man? Yes. Mm -hmm. And so it was most definitely um, a time with love. Mm -hmm. Patience, empathy, mm -hmm. and concern had to be utilized. Yes. Mm -hmm. you know, because in spite of um, the horrific experiences mm -hmm. of any form mm -hmm. of incarceration, the only thing that's really going to allow you to go through that experience mm -hmm. and be debriefed correctly is the power and the unity of brotherhood, yes, sir. love, mm -hmm. family, or mm -hmm. however you want to label it. Mm -hmm. so oh. That's what it was mm -hmm. about. Yes, sir. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you shared that with me. You talk about, you know, just the family um, having, to, you know, having their uncle there. You know, they're still growing within those 32 years, you know, becoming, you know, women becoming, you know, children, you know, boys becoming adults. And and but yet a, a different man, if you will, came back home. And and, and you said early on, Brother Hum, you said that your wife was very instrumental, if you will, in your transition, you know, in your uh, say, I'm going to use the word rehabilitation. I like to use the word rehabilitation, mm -hmm. but I use it in the context of is that like someone who's, uh, if you will, who's been an addict and they're in recovery and they're working on their sobriety each and every day. Because for me, rehabilitation is it, it's a, just a daily process mm -hmm. for me. And me rehabilitating myself. 
because I have more years on the other side of the wall, if you will, on this side of the wall. So now having to make sure that every day that I'm mindful is that those triggers are still there. Those behave a lot better than you know, better than where I was, but they're still part of me. It's still connected with it because you don't, your experiences are still there. They don't go, as the brother alluded to, that, you know, it goes maybe into your long-term memory mm -hmm. or those triggers to store in your long-term memory. But a, a sound, a word or something can be used that can bring that up. And many times we think, okay, well, you know, I'm pretty good week. I'm, I'm doing okay. Then something can happen can take you immediately back to that place. It's, oh, man, you, you think, man, I thought I was past that, man. Because not having really, if you will, standing God over yourself. So in what ways that where your wife instrumental, say, in helping you, you know, just becoming, you know, getting to a place to where uh, you're able to uh, uh, to cope better, if you will. Um, she was instrumental in her patience. Mm -hmm. Okay. Even though she didn't really understand mm -hmm. the psychological effect uh, that took place, but she was patient. Mm -hmm. She was very patient. Um, meaning that I'm quite sure she knew something was awkward or mm -hmm. off mm -hmm. with me, mm -hmm. and she could associate that with my being in prison. Mm -hmm. um, she was very patient. Mm -hmm. She was she was very patient. Um, and one of the things that I don't know if she knows what she done. Mm -hmm. She kept taking me out. So by mm -hmm. me going okay. out. Socializing, yeah. Socializing, interacting mm. with mm. people. Mm. Um, it was breaking a barrier. Mm. It was breaking me down. Mm. Because if if she didn't do that, mm. I probably would not have done it. Mm. Because I was um, kind of nervous. Mm. Okay. Um, mm. Even safe to say scared. Mm. Because it's, it's a different mm. environment. It's a different atmosphere. And what I was really scared about mm. or nervous about mm. was how I was going to respond. Right. I didn't right, know how right, I was right, going to right. respond. Mm. Mm. I'm gonna give you an example, a, a, a clear example. She and I was um, at Burlington Coke Factory, and um, we were uh, about to check our things out, mm. and a woman in front of me uh, passed out. She dropped her head slightly hit the conveyor belt mm. and i stood there and i stepped back mm. and my wife said why you ain't helping what's wrong with you mm. in my mind mm. if i if i touch her mm. i might get locked up right yes like sir. i went straight mm -hmm. to prison right yes, like sir. i'm not touching anything right mm. because that's the environment that i came from and in mm. situations like mm. that mm. if you try to help someone that was stabbed mm. up or mm. beat up mm. and they on the ground and you get caught, mm. you know, bending over, helping, mm. uh, you a part of that. Right. Yes, sir. And you're going to mm. be getting convenience. Right. So, um, yeah, I was really uh, mm. socially, mm. like, off. So she helped me by being patient and um, mm. taking me different places mm. and allowing me to interact mm. with society mm. in different environments. Um, I want to piggyback mm. off of Marvin mm. because he summed it up so Perfectly, a unit was broke. Right. Mm -hmm. Um. When I came home, it was awkward being around my mother. Mm. Awkward being around my father. Mm. Awkward being around certain friends that I grew up with. Awkward being around my son, even though my son and my parents, um, throughout my incarceration, came to see me all the time. Mm -hmm. But that hour is not enough right, to really right. reconnect right. or connect. Mm -hmm. That connection that I had with my mother and my father was completely broke. Right. It mm -hmm. was seven. Mm -hmm. So when I got released, it was very mm -hmm. awkward mm -hmm. being around them. Mm -hmm. Very awkward to talk to them because for 21 years, mm -hmm. my life been um, somewhere else and on a different level. Yeah. Yeah. So I really couldn't even interact. Mm. I couldn't interact really with my wife, mm. to be honest, mm. social. Mm. Um, and That's I've been knowing problem. her mm. for mm. Uh, a very long time, mm. since she was uh, 12 and I mm. was 14. So uh, I couldn't really interact with her. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. And she would often say, like, you know, getting you to talk is like, I got to use pliers and <laughs> pull your teeth out. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. You know, but she's, you know, she, 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 she's writing what she's saying. And unfortunately for the whys who are left behind or the, and at the time, and they don't know mm-hmm. because it's a new experience for them as well. Mm-hmm. And there's really no handbook, if you will, no mm-hmm. rule book saying, okay, you know, this is what you do. When, when your husband will return home. Mm-hmm. So they're l- learning themselves and they're having to learn by going through those experiences. Oh, because Marvin said something when you talked about, he said, you know, being stuck, you mm-hmm. know, and, you know, for the 32. So when he came home, as you say, the awkwardness is, is that we're social creatures. You know, we interact in a social way. Uh, we're not meant, obviously, uh, you know, to be alone, to live alone, even though some men women choose to be alone. But that's uh, that's not the intent of nature, if you will. So those 21 years, those 30 years in growing and developing, that was developed in a social environment with other people. Mm. So that was, if you will, so that was 20, even though these are biologically your parents, you know, but you don't know them. Mm-hmm. And there are men in the prison who know you better than maybe your biological brother. Absolutely. Because they'll spend 21 years or 32 years, you know, 12 years, if you will, you know, you're, you know, getting to know you, exchanging, you know, understanding, you know, who you are as a person, the things mm-hmm. you like, things you dislike, you know, the sharing of one another, things mm-hmm. that, you know, that we didn't do with our own biological brother. Mm-hmm. So they know of us and say, well, yeah, that's my brother right there. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I can call a brother right now. Dao was up, you know, he did 27 years in prison. You know, we're closer in terms of, 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 of brother in that way and knowing each other than my own biological brother. And I love my biological brother, mm-hmm. but they don't know me in the way that Dao know me. Yeah. And so, and so, so it's called that, as you will, that social interaction was disconnected. The mm-hmm. unit was broken. And and so now the what our family are operating off, what we're operating off of is that I'm aware of who this person is, but I really don't know. So so the love mm-hmm. is there, mm-hmm. but but um I like to use the phrase that uh brother Rev Brown he referring to when he said when he said that black necessary but it's not sufficient. Mm-hmm. Love is necessary but it's not sufficient. There has to be an understanding and awareness so what your wife had to experience with you is that, you know, relearning who this man was that came home. So you talked about being withdrawn, taking you out, being social isolated. So all the terms you use, social isolation, or social anxiety, you know, depression, avoid. These are psychological effects of the long-term incarceration. Mm-hmm. Like myself, even today, you know, and I'm 65 years old, but still, you know, uh, you know going into a store, someone just might just start talking to you. That was uncommon. Mm-hmm. You know, he's just, you know, it's just, you know, you, you, know, you, you know, you get on the alert. I'm better than I was when I first came home. But definitely, you know, just, you know, you come out here, you're in the grocery store somewhere. People walk, you start talking to you. Hey, buddy, how you doing? So, whoa, whoa, play out the man. You know, you move up and get all up in your face, man. You know what you're saying? But you think, you you know, you, you're you realizing, okay, let me take a deep breath for a minute. Mm. But immediately going back to, you know, you know, that boundary, that thing, if you will, you set for yourself is that, just certain things you just didn't do is behind the wall, mm-hmm. you know, which is how you approach people, man. Right. But out here is is they're not giving, if you will, thought to those behaviors. Now we come home years later mm-hmm. and we gotta live within this environment. But now they're making decisions in, in their everyday life, not even being conscious of that who they are around. And so when they interact with us, they're just basically being themselves, if you will, uh in an unknowingly way, that yet but the person they're interacting with. Is some who just came out of the environment 20 years, 30 years, and 40 years, and the slightest thing may have triggered something just by the fact he's walked up to you, or like you say, can be uh to be in the grocery store and you stand in line and they're reaching all across to grab you mm-hmm. something like this right here. They're not trying to be funny or anything, mm-hmm. but they're not just really conscious of what they're doing. But immediately, you know, again, you 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 back to that, back to that place again and having to be mindful of that. I can remember, you know, you brothers both know uh Walter Lomax and mm-hmm. And I can remember, you know, we, he and I was talking, him and y'all, we was talking one day, and he was saying that when he came home, man, he was, uh, you know, in the grocery store, and people just walking up talking to him. He really knew how to respond. He knew how to, how to talk to people, but he just, he wasn't used to that. You know, people just walking, and he had to really learn to be engaged in a conversation, just learn how to have a conversation with someone. Mm-hmm. You know, learning something new is just, you know, in a friendly kind of way. And, but, but that was an experience as well, mm-hmm. so... So I'm glad you brought that up, but also just giving, you know, the wives and the parents, you know, the credit they deserve because they are obviously just is is lost, if you will. 
uh, you know, when we return home, you know, how do we interact, you know, with the child, with the son, with the husband that, you know, who's home now. And, and so it, it is, and it's like men like yourself you that, you know, having these conversations that can share with the listening audience or someone out there possibly, you know, have a husband who may be coming home soon or a mm. son coming home soon. And they can tune in and realize, okay, well, maybe have at least a, a better understanding gotcha. of possibly what, uh, you know, when my son, when my husband return, some of the things they have to do. Because obviously, and I'm sure your wife has a story to tell herself. <laughs> you know, you tell it from your perspective. <laughs> As we say, you know, we talk about, you know, the stories are we told from the hunter perspective. The lion always going to lose. Right. But, but let's get the lion story. You know, how do you feel about being hunted? <laughs> so we tell the story from, you know. We can tell from the wife perspective, but my wife tell me all the time, brother, come out there sale. Mm -hmm. mm. I like that phrase. But sometimes I be in the house, man, and she will come to tell me, come out of that sale, man. Mm. You know, because <clears throat> I go to that place, like like you say yourself, you not get withdrawn, you know, and just kind of isolate myself. But the thing is, and it's gonna sound crazy. I want you to bear what I'm saying. I'm okay, but I'm not okay, if you will. Mm -hmm. When I'm when I'm like that, you know, I'm not frustrated about nothing. Well, absolutely. Yeah. We will learn uh, to be very efficient in our deficiency. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I had I have a client and one of, and he mm -hmm. suffered from certain mental disorders, and he shared with me because we're talking about triggers. He shared with me how he utilized so certain coping mechanisms to deal with his triggers. Yes, sir. But they're only temporary solutions mm -hmm. to a long-term lasting effect. You mentioned recovery. And that was such a beautiful word because a lot of times when we do return back to our family, we're coming back with psychological and mental disorders. Right, that's right. Yeah. And unfortunately, there's no place like Al Anon or mm, Non Anon right, for right. people to learn how to deal with the mental and emotional disorders mm -hmm. of returning citizens or even yeah. people in our community right. that are suffering great. Yeah, that's right. And that's so right. we have to learn in our families, and I'm, I'm, I'm so glad you, you, you're paying credence that they've so rightfully deserve. Mm -hmm. They're dealing with a uh, person with these deficiencies coming back mm -hmm. into their environment mm -hmm. and potentially triggering mm -hmm. right. or right. exacerbating mm -hmm. their own mental deficiencies. Or their own emotional uh, 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 um, disorder. Mm -hmm. And so what can we do about it? Mm -hmm. We know the problem. So yes, what sir. becomes the solution? Yes. Yes. And, mm -hmm. and, and the solution is what you said. Mm -hmm. We have to be committed mm -hmm. to recovering. Right. That's right. Yes, now, sir. how does recovering mm -hmm. look? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Because yes. unfortunately, we perish by lack of mm -hmm. adequate mm -hmm. information. Right. Right. That's right. For so long, the information that's been given to us in order to recover mm -hmm. from these emotional or, mm -hmm. or, or or social or political or financial disconnects mm -hmm. has not been sufficient enough mm -hmm. to allow us to experience right mm -hmm. something healthy, right. mm -hmm. something well. Mm -hmm. It contributes to a perpetual cycle that. The recidivism rate mm. is astronomical. Mm, that's right. Mm. Well, you're absolutely right, brother. See, I'm glad you brought that up because, you know, in your, I guess, if you will, closing remarks around that, you know, you know what are some of the solutions? You know, what is it that we can do differently? Because as we both know, uh, when we talk about, if you will, you no know, substance abuse, you know, mm. of course, they have, you know, Narcotics Anonymous or uh, Alcohol, you know, you know, Alcoholic Anonymous or, you know, domestic violence. So each group, social group, that has been impacted in some kind of psychological way yeah. or medical way, they have those kind of support groups. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that that I've worked on, that I continue to work on, which I call my TA Transition Anonymous, really, and, you know, and, no, and, 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 and this is part of the men behind bars, if you will, the, the bullpen, you know, men behind bars is, is, you know, it's the organization, you know, that I've started. But under men behind bars, you know, is the brand, but there is no mental health component. There is a, you know, soon to be a component where you're talking about those support groups that where, you know, for men and family as well, that will how to begin to put things in place that would allow, you know, to further the healing, to further the rehabilitate, to having, you know, correct information, because a lot of the information that we've been exposed to 
possibly is, you know, you say it's misinformation. Mm -hmm. You know, who's telling the stories? But when you have men like yourself and even the women who've been on this program, I definitely want to bring more sisters on, you know, I'm sure we all know sisters who've been incarcerated, mm -hmm. you know, telling stories. So, you know, they have a wealth of information, but the information has to be one brought to the, uh, we're brought to the public. How do we take that information? How do we pack the information? There were now more and more men and women and families who are having these experiences. They have access to this information. Mm -hmm. So that's why for me, Transition Anonymous was something, well, again, was the brainchild that I had that I'm working on. They wanted, you know, and just again, like bringing me, like I said, you know, you know, just telling our stories, but yet having a healing environment. Because for me, it really is, it is a daily process of the rehabilitation aspect of it, transitioning from one in that environment of with that world to this world, it is a daily experience for mm -hmm. me, making sure that I'm doing what I need to do to make one that know that I'm correct, but as well as my family, my children, that environment, and how am I contributing to that? So it's a uh, very key thing. So to me, that's part of the solution. So, and um, if you will, so brother, mom, ask you this right here: What would have been helpful for you when you came home if some things would have been in place? I'm asking you the same question, brother. Mom. Um, to be honest, to have a platform like this, yes, sir. Yes. As I'm sitting here, um, you know, being interviewed by you, mm -hmm. um, what you don't know, mm -hmm. um, and what the audience um, don't know is that it's really therapeutic. Yes, sir. While I'm being interviewed, I'm also um, looking at myself, mm -hmm. and what I've shared this morning, mm -hmm. I really haven't talked about. Mm -hmm. And a light bulb had went off that I said to myself while you were speaking with Mr. Marvin that I still have um, things within me that I'm, I'm still suppressing. Mm -hmm. So a platform like this um, would have been very helpful mm -hmm. because we carry so much. You know, it's not a light switch. Yes, I've done 21 years. That's right. That's right. You know, mm -hmm. um, others done longer mm -hmm. but i've done 21 years mm -hmm. so just placing me back into society mm -hmm. that's not a switch mm -hmm. that you turn on mm -hmm. and then i'm normal right mm -hmm. um this is very helpful mm -hmm. because we all have a story that we have within ourselves and it's not being released mm -hmm. and it needs to come out yes, i need to be around Men such as yourself. Mm. If I had that, then um, things probably mm. will be mm. a whole lot different. Yes, sir. Mm. A whole lot different. In fact, you shared that, brother, and it's as well as yourself, brother Bobby. So, what would have been helpful to when you came return home as a returning citizen? Well, in hindsight, I would have to agree with you, mm. brother. However, I'm taught that we plot and plan. But a loss of mm -hmm. dollar is the best of plan. That's right, brother. So um, I said that to say this. Everything happened exactly mm -hmm. the way that it was supposed to happen. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. right. And what, for me, is not so much as what could have been in play, mm -hmm. should have been in play then. Yes, sir. It's what is in play now. Yes, sir. And mm -hmm. what is in play now, like the brother so eloquently stated, is a platform such as the one that you are allowing us to be a part of this morning, as well as mm. all of the other magnificent work that you're doing mm. in collaboration with people such as ourselves yes, concerning the work that we're doing. Yes, sir. So because I'm a, I'm a staunch advocate that it takes a village mm. not only to raise a child, but to heal a community. That's right. And right. so it's the collaborational aspects mm. of men coming together mm. to um, create the solutions as mm -hmm. opposed to continue to perpetuate the problem. Mm -hmm. yes, That's what needs to be done. Okay, brother. Well, we definitely coming up on this 11 o'clock uh, hour, but uh, so if someone wanted to, you know, again, you can tell me, reach out to you about what the work that you're doing. How can, I guess, they get in contact with you? Or? Well, um, you can contact me at Garner, G-A-R-N-E-R, -E Marvin, M I. M A R V I N, the number zero mm -hmm. at gmail.com. <laughs> yes, or you can uh, visit my office. It's located at 9 North Utah Street. Uh, I'm with an organization called the Sons of Things. And um, that's various ways that you can.
contact. Yes, sir. Brother Muhammad? Um, you can contact uh, me through uh, my Gmail. That's MuhammadJames19 at Gmail. Um, or you can contact me through uh, Facebook mm-hmm. under James Muhammad. Yes, and you'll see my picture. And, it's, and, and, and for myself is that if you definitely want to know more about uh, you know, the bullpen, a man behind bars, the work these brothers are doing, you definitely can reach out to me at freshair112194 at gmail.com. Again, that's freshair112194 at gmail.com. Um, and, you know, you have, maybe you have questions about what you heard this morning. Maybe you have a, a father or a brother or a sister who's returning home. If you need some more information. You know, whatever your question may be, um, trust me, I've heard it all before. Definitely you can reach out to me. You can send me an email. You can reach out to Max Raglan on Facebook as well. We're in contact with me. Again, I want to thank Brother Asar, you know, for allowing us to use his space. I definitely want to thank, you know, my brother um, Marvin over here, Brother Muhammad over here, you know, for taking time out of their schedules to be here this morning. And, and I'm sure they've shared something with you all uh, that will give you, you no know, food for thought, if you will, something to think about. Definitely reach out to these men. You may have a wealth of information. Men are doing work within the community. And as brother say, he's going to take all of us. It's going to take a village to really get the hands. But specifically, this platform is for men and women who have been incarcerated, who have a platform, a healing place where they can come. They can tell their story, but also share their experiences, but also find help and relief from what they're possibly having to deal with. Because we all need that. And I'm a staunch advocate for that. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted, you know, you know, the creation of bullpen. And as I talked about uh, Transition Anonymous as well, soon to be erected in the planning stage as well, that we can have a, a safe space, if you will, that where we can come and let the healing begin. So, again, I thank you all for tuning in. I look forward to the next time. Again, tune in to bullpen. It is the last Sunday of each month. Great topics. We have a variety of topics. You, know, you guys have a safe, have a great week, and look forward to the next time. Peace. Hey, my brother. Pleasure, sir. Thank you, Muhammad. Oh, thank you.